All right, good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today, I think about, uh, at least I think this is what I'm going to talk about, we'll see how the notes come out, uh, about uh, what makes uh, a master. Um, you know, I think that everybody, everybody lives their life and everybody has lots of experience. What is it, you know, they say, when you don't get what you want, what you get is experience. So we all have lots of experience. Uh, but I think one of the things that, that's true about individuals who become masters at something is, um, first of all, they don't give up. Hmm? You know, if you, if you quit before the game's over, you never really know how the game's going to turn out, or you don't get to have uh, input into how that game turns out. I think also that individuals who are masters at something, they have this very important capacity that we teach in the science of mind about being self-reflective. You know, that this capacity to look within and say, okay, I'm the common denominator here in my experiences. What do I have to do with this? And so often, you know, in Science of Mind, because we talk about our thinking so much, we think, well, but I didn't really think the thoughts that, that fit with this experience. How did this happen to me? But, you know, one of the things I think that we come to realize over time that it's not just our thinking. It's sort of the, uh, the way we hold things, what we allow, what we believe, what we accept. Are we a welcome place for an experience to happen? It's not just like we thought a thought and then that experience uh, happened for us. So I think that to be self-reflective, uh, to, to be paying attention, you know, because if we're paying attention, then when something similar shows up in our life again down the road, we're going to know because we'll have learned from it. And see, and this is one of the things I really think that masters have achieved is that they have learned from the experience they've had in life. Now, for myself, I know that sometimes I've repeated experiences again and again and again and wondered why I was repeating them because clearly, clearly, when I sat and thought about it, I realized, oh, I didn't get it the first time or the second time or the third time or even the fourth or fifth time. This is why it's here. And you know, when they come around again, it seems like that the experiences get bigger and hairier and more audacious, don't they? You know, it's like, okay, like the universe is saying, you didn't get it before, so how about now? Here's an opportunity to heal that consciousness of yours. Um, and I think that masters continually strive, they commit to do better. Having learned from the experience that they have lived through, they are committed to doing better. Someone in my office a while back, um, I always just thought this was so, so funny, uh, Elizabeth Taylor came up while we were talking, which is kind of a funny thing. And, uh, and, uh, and so we were talking about relationship. And Elizabeth Taylor came up in the conversation. And, and they uh, indicated that they thought Elizabeth Taylor was you know, trifling, that she wasn't serious about love in her life. And I said, oh, I disagree. And they said, really, how can you? She's been married like eight times, and sometimes to the same person twice, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I said because I think at, at a tremendously deep level, she was going to master love. And in order to master love, she had to keep coming up to the plate to bat, right? <laughs> a baseball analogy, first sports analogy of the year, you know? <laughs> but, but there it is, you know? I mean, if you're not in the game, you can't possibly win. And I think she was really committed to the experience of mastery in the area of love, which is why she kept going for it. Now, you know, so many of us would say, oh, no, I tried that once. It was so painful. I'm never going to do that again. Well, that's no way to master an experience, is it? And this is also especially, especially true, I believe, in our teaching when we talk about healing. Because, you know, if, if the first time you treat or affirm or visualize or start to do your own inner spiritual work, if that very first time you don't have instant healing, then people give up. And, you know, consciousness takes as long to change as it takes. And everybody's different. So some people have an extraordinary belief and an extraordinary faith and an extraordinary receptivity, and healing happens very, very quickly for them, just because they are a very willing place. And others, others of us, it takes a little longer. It takes time to reconcile our faith, to build greater, deeper faith, to actually have the belief that this could happen. And why not me? Because we teach that God is everywhere equally present. So the power that we're dealing with in the science of mind is, is, is principle, not personality, we say. You know? And where we have um, a real embodiment, 
where things really, really become true, like on the inside of us, and you could not convince me of something different, that's where we have a demonstration. That's where we have a healing. You know, it's so interesting to me that really it was with the advent of metaphysics in America that people started to consider that there was a reality beyond what we see with our physical senses. That we believe in the science of mind that there is another dimension, there is another plane, or there are multiple other planes of existence. And so just because we don't see someone or don't see something does not mean that they don't exist, does not mean that they're not with us. All it means is we can't see them right now. You know, because the science of mind is very, very clear. Life, the principle of life that demonstrates itself as us, life that we are, is always life. Life never works against itself. You know, so new thought says, yes, there is this world of appearances that we are all dealing with. We're all confronted, we're bombarded with appearances all the time. And what it takes to sit in the seat of our own consciousness, you know, to sit in my prayer chair and say, but beyond all these appearances that are beating me up constantly, being presented to me all the time, there is a spiritual truth. We could think of it like a divine blueprint, you know, and, and spirit, God has this divine blueprint for each of us in our life and our whole journey. And you know, most of us don't know what anybody else's blueprint looks like. Isn't that extraordinary? Because the truth is, I don't know what all of my own blueprint looks like. And I try to consider it on a daily basis. You know, what am I here to do? What am I here to do? What should I be doing? God, speak to me, show me, show me in a way I understand. You know how thick I am. You know, make it really plain, skywriting's good. You know, billboards, you name it. Show me in a way I can understand and use. If, if we want to, if what we experience, excuse me, I have to put my eyes on here. If what we experience and have is something that we don't particularly want, we have to, Ernest Holmes teaches us in The Science of Mind, what we have to do is that we have to erase that from our consciousness. And he says the way we do that is to pour in, I love that, to pour in the constructive opposite. So I think of that pour in like Niagara Falls, not like a trickle from my kitchen sink. You know, I mean, just this enormous pouring in. And how we do that is I say, okay, I'm gonna treat, and I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna affirm, and I'm gonna study, and I'm gonna do all of this work on a daily basis, because that, to me, is really pouring in the constructive opposite. Ernest says in our textbook that, he says, after you pour in the constructive opposite, this will neutralize the other thought, right? So whatever limited, fearful, doubting, stinking thinking you may have, this will neutralize that. Then he says, then we must maintain a consistent, positive, aggressive, mental attitude in truth. You know, so it's not like you just kind of wimp out and give up, okay, that's it. You know, it's like, no, no, no. You have to be really proactive in your pursuit of healing, of demonstration of the spiritual truth. You know, you can't just put in one positive thought. I mean, hey, one positive thought's better than one negative thought, you know? But the truth is, one affirmative idea alone, I think, has the capacity to set us free, to heal us, but generally, 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 at least this is my experience, is that it takes time because consciousness seems to heal incrementally. Consciousness seems to grow incrementally. You know, so we pray and pray and pray and meditate and meditate, and meditate, study, 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 and there's like a little ping that goes off inside our head, in our mind, our soul. And it says, okay, I've grown a little bit. And we pray and study and meditate and pray and study and meditate and then ping and we've grown a little bit more. And part of how we know this is true is that we see ourselves operating in life and we say, hmm, I was a little more patient there. I was a little more kind there. I wanted to say something snarky there, but I didn't. You know? I wanted to push them off a cliff, but I didn't. You know, I'm, we see ourselves actually improving, right? Which is a wonderful thing. You know, because that's what we're after. We're, we're, we're after some level of improvement here. You know, Ernest teaches us in the science of mind that humankind is limited because we've not allowed the divine within us to more completely express. So I think this becomes our job. How do I let the divine within me, that presence of God, that presence of infinite loving intelligent spirit that's everywhere and within me, how do I allow that to express more completely by means of me. And of course, the way, the way in 
for all of us, I believe, is through our spiritual practice, that we have to be in an ongoing relationship with that presence of spirit within. You know? So Jesus said, as you believe, so it shall be done unto you. And I love that. I love that. I think that's a foundation scripture to, to our teaching in the science of mind. But if our belief is small, then all we can have is a small experience. If our belief is limited, all we can have is a very, very limited experience. But our teaching is that we can experience as much as we can embody. It's not like the universe ever says, no, you've had enough good. You need to just back off, let some other people have some good for a while. That's not the way the universe works, right? It's you can have as much as you can embody, right? So in the science of mind, the self that each of us is, 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 is spirit manifesting. So there is no separation, no distance between God and our true self, right? So, because we teach this principle of one life, one God. No other power is operating. There's nothing to contradict our good. So another way to say this is this is actually the law of attraction in the universe. You know that we all use it. Uh, I think we're using it all the time. We're either drawing experiences to us or we're pushing experiences away. Mm -hmm. and, and because there's a sense where everything that comes into our life, I believe, comes in for a purpose. Now, that purpose might very well be to get us to decide what we want to do. You know, we say that this is for me, I accept this. This is not for me, I, I do not accept this in any way. So, so people will ask and they'll say, well, what about, what about people suffering? People clearly do not invite suffering in, or people are not inviting lack in, they're not inviting limitation in. Well, the spiritual truth about these things is that they are not necessary, but sometimes we believe in them. You know, this is what Emma Curtis Hopkins teaches us again and again in her work, and then Ernest continues on with this. It's not that these conditions are necessary, but because people believe in them, that's why they show up as experience. Because what we attract is the outpicturing of what we believe. You know, so <clears throat> think of it this way, that you as a being, and this is true of every, every being, every being gives off an invisible emanation. We all give off a vibration. We all give off a frequency into the universe. <clears throat> and the universe finds what matches that frequency, that vibration, and that's what the universe gives back to us. Right? So as a result, that's why we have the experiences we have. You know, if we look at our life and say, you know, I, I could not possibly, you know, how, how could I possibly have attracted this to me? Could I have had something to do with this? The answer is yes, yes, you had something to do with this. And so we have to ask ourselves, what did I have faith in? Where was my conviction? Where was their acceptance on my part? You know, so Dr. Holmes teaches about this principle of attraction in the Science of Mind track textbook. And basically the way he says it is as we attract what we're thinking about. But I think, it's, I think he's simplifying it for us there. I think it is also about this notion of uh, what we emanate, uh, the frequency that we hold, the vibration that, that we inhabit. I think it's, it's, it's along those lines as well. But I think this is good news. This is good news because if we don't like what we're attracting, we can realize that this is not visited, visited upon us by some punishing God, that, but that our thinking, you know, that our energy, our mental, spiritual, emotional energy is, is what contributed to this, right? So if we don't, like, we don't like it, then we are the ones to do something about it. We are here to express what we are, and I believe what every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth is, is that we are unique expressions of divine consciousness. So I want to learn from everything, because that's what a master does. Somebody comes into my life, okay, there's a reason they came into my life, I want to learn from that. I have a particular experience out in the world, whether it's an experience I like or not, I want to learn from that. I want to be open to all of it because I believe this is what a master does. Why is this here? What am I supposed to get from this? And now, and it's not just about getting from an experience too because I believe that what a master knows is that they are there to give into every experience. It's not just that the universe is doing it to me. It's that, oh, the reason I'm aware of this is because I'm supposed to be lending my consciousness, my love, my light, my good energy into this situation, right? Because to just, to just sit back and say, well, let's see what the universe does to me, um, that's not a very empowered approach, I, th I think. Um, I, think um, it's, I, th it's, I think it's actually kind of simple. This attraction thing is like, 
it goes like this. It's, water seeks its own level. Consciousness seeks its own level. You know? So regardless of what we're saying, you know, that ultimately that which is ours by right of consciousness always finds us. It always, always finds us. The people, the experiences, whatever that is. So I think we have an extraordinary, extraordinary ability to attract. You know? But the thing is we have to put our consciousness on that which we desire to attract on a regular, regular basis. People love to say, oh, gee, I didn't have anything to do with creating this. But you know, that would mean that, what we're experien that we're living in a random universe where crazy stuff just, just happens out of the blue. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's true. It must have been established in consciousness somewhere. How about in us? You know, it must become a part of us. You know, we have an infinite principle at our disposal. We must know that we're all creative beings, you know, and as a creative being, we can never, ever stop creating, right? So I think this idea of, of attracting, this is really about emanating what you really are. Attraction is about emanating what is within you. Um, you know, Jesus had a lot of faith, clearly, when he told the paralyzed man to get up and walk. And, 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 I, and I like that story. He had completely accepted the truth of this man's wholeness, and he had the equivalent of the response, right? Like he accepted, the, you know, it's like, imagine somebody says to you, oh, I'm so sick, I've been waiting for healing for years, I'm so sick, I'm so sick, I'm so sick. But you know there's more to them. You know there's more to them, and this is what Jesus did. He's like, yeah, it's like saying, yes, I know you're dealing with a condition that's called sickness, or you're dealing with a condition called lack, or you're dealing with a condition called loneliness, or whatever that may be for you, but that's not all of who you are, because who you are is this infinite spiritual being. And birth was not a beginning for you, and death will not be an ending for you. That spirit that you are has existed for eons before you got here. I mean, think about that, that the essence of you, the soul of you, the spirit of you has existed for eons. And here we are together. What an extraordinary thing. And when you leave this hotel, <laughs> spirit that you are, the consciousness that you are, continues on that just because we don't see someone or something physically doesn't mean that it doesn't continue to exist fully and completely. In fact, Ernest Holmes says, that when we, um, when we move into the next expression, we're not less of ourself, we are actually more of ourself, which I think is a thrilling thing. It's like, wow, we're more of who we truly, truly are. So although God is infinite, you know, um, their spirit, the universe is infinite, but there are no possibilities for us beyond our present concepts. So, I think that the master consciousness always knows there's more. There's more to experience. There's more to forgive. There's more to give into a situation. There's more love. That, this, that everything that shows up, everything that catches my attention, has something to do with me. Either it's a call for me to heal something within me, or it's an opportunity for, give, uh, for me to give that love and light and consciousness that's within me out into the world. It's up to us what we do with it. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to just remember that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. That God, divine intelligence, is the truth about each and every one of us. And so in this awareness, knowing we are connected with God, with spirit, and that we're all connected with each other, on the unseen side of life, I speak the word for us that each and every one of us, we are in the process of becoming a master on our own spiritual journey. I know that we learn from everything and everyone that comes into our life and experience, that nothing happens by random, and that on the unseen side of life where we are all connected, there is a divine agreement for everyone's growth and healing and unfoldment. And I accept for each and every person here and those who might be watching us, that healing is taking place right now because we truly believe that with God, all things are possible. And so we include in our prayer today our family members, our parents and children, all of those we love and hold near and dear. And we remind ourselves that right where they are, the fullness, the allness of God's spirit is there. 
healing, loving, ministering, lifting up. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So where there is the appearance of separation, where there is the appearance of duality or fear or doubt, we claim the truth that God's love is present everywhere in everyone, that the peace of God surrounds and fills every being, and that there is a perfect solution to every seeming problem on the face of our globe. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is healing and there is raising up, that there is an inner transformation that's taking place within us right now, and we welcome it. We absolutely say yes to it. So with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks that this is so for each and every one of us, that we are blessed to be together in consciousness today. And with a grateful heart, I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.